Hello and welcome. My name is Ginger Fay and I work at Appleruth, which is a tutoring and test prep company that helps students all over the world prepare to do their very best academically as well as on college entrance exams like the SAT and the ACT. We are delighted to have you joining us this evening. Our special guest tonight is Lisa Hillhouse, who has graciously offered to answer any and all questions you have about applying to military service academies and ROTC scholarships. Lisa herself is a veteran having served in the Air Force for more than a quarter of a century. She spent the majority of that time assigned to the United States Air Force Academy and Air Force ROTC in admissions and academics. Her passion is empowering young people to develop their leadership skills and challenge themselves to reach their dreams. As an educational consultant, Lisa works with students around the globe who have both military and civilian goals and also consults with other educators to help their students achieve their commissioning goals. So thank you, Lisa, for joining us. Um, thank you also for your service um, as we look ahead to Armed Forces Day on Saturday. Um, it's a nice time to be grateful um, for the men and women who um, serve in all branches of the military. And we are especially lucky to be joined tonight by two of Lisa's students. Jojo and Alex have just themselves gone through the application process for college and had an interest in um, pursuing a service academy as part of their um, process. And so I'm excited to get to hear a little bit more of their stories. Um, they've been through this process so very recently and have lots of good advice to share. So I thank both of you for joining us as well. It's a really a special treat. Um, I want to let everybody know that tonight's presentation is being being recorded. Um, so if you can't find a pen, um, if you're watching this while you're also making dinner and all the other things that um, people are busy doing at this time of the evening, we are more than happy to share this recording with you. And Lisa has graciously volunteered to share the slides um, that are part of this presentation as well. So look for that in your email tomorrow. Um, if you have questions tonight, please feel free to pop them in the Q&A box. Um, you can put them in at any time they occur to you and we will be happy to answer as many of them as we can squeeze into the next hour. Um, so Lisa, I'm gonna let you get us started um, with this conversation and then I'll, I'll join in as we get closer to um, opening the floor for, for questions and answers, but questions are welcome anytime. Got it. Thank you, Ginger, for the warm welcome. And I'm so delighted to be here. Um, as Ginger said, I'm a retired Air Force officer. I now continue to work in academics. And the Air Force was a total game changer for my life and my family's life. And I'm just really passionate about helping people pursue this because it is a complicated process. It is challenging. It's going to double your workload, but without um, that hard work, there's no great satisfaction. So I'm going to take this away. Okay, Ginger did a great job talking about me already. So let's move on. Um, I have two wonderful students here. I'd like to have them just do a short introduction and then they are definitely gonna be jumping into the slideshow to talk about their experiences because I know you really wanna hear from students who just did this. So Alex, why don't you start? Okay, hi, I'm Alex. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia and I'm gonna be entering the United States Air Force Academy this summer. Good, Jojo. Hi, I'm Jojo Flower and I'm from a suburb of San Francisco in California. I'm finishing up my senior year right now and I'll be entering my freshman year at Vanderbilt University in the fall and doing Navy ROTC. Awesome. And then um, Jojo also applied to the Air Force Academy and to Air Force ROTC and received an Academy appointment and an Air Force scholarship. So she's seen it from both the ROTC and the Academy side, and then also um, the Navy side. And then Alex was also fortunate enough to be um, recruited as an athlete by several civilian and military colleges too. So she'll talk a little bit about that later. So I wanted to start really quickly and say what an officer does in the military because a lot of people really don't know. Um, if you look at the military branches, there's six. We now also have the Space Force, which um, stood up in December of 2019. And each branch has a very small amount of people who from day one are the leaders and managers and really taking care of their people. So officers can be anywhere from 10 to about 18% of a military branch. 
and they must have an accredited bachelor's degree and go through some kind of commissioning program. So most students that are watching this want to go to a military service academy, and that is how you get your commission as a lieutenant or as an ensign. Um, there's also ROTC programs, so you are a full-time college student doing a part-time leadership training program. And another popular option that we won't talk about, but is officer training or officer commissioning school. So most officers come through one of those. Um, if you are an officer in the military, you are usually a generalist. So I started as a logistician, then I worked in human resources, but then I spent the rest of my career in education and leadership development. Um, some officers who have specialist roles might be an Apache helicopter pilot, a um, experimental engineer, a nurse practitioner, something like that. Um, officers also have more autonomy over their assignments, where they go, when, the, the professional education and degree programs they want to do. And then the last thing to note is that military communities are freestanding. And so every job you have in the civilian world and then some are in the military. So for example, you could be in the army and be a veterinarian. You could be a um, cybersecurity officer in the Air Force. You could be working in air traffic control, um, just so many different things, legal officer, chaplain, et cetera. There are five military service academies. Um, you could see each of those here and also their locations. So most are on the East Coast. And when we talk about the academies, most people know about the big three. So Army, also called West Point, Navy, referred to as Annapolis, and the Air Force Academy. Um, they're better known because they're larger. They have 4,000 plus cadets or midshipmen there. Um, they also have D1 sports, so maybe you've seen the Commander's Cup or some of those athletic battles, um, and they consistently rank as some of the best engineering programs in the country, also schools that have the um, smallest teacher-student ratio, best mentoring, best research opportunities, things like that. Um, I am very partial to the two smaller academies that I feel like don't always get the attention they deserve. Um, one is the Coast Guard Academy and the other is the Merchant Marine Academy. Those are in Connecticut and New York respectively, and they focus on the maritime mission. So in addition to the Navy having the maritime mission, you have them there. Um, those schools are much smaller, about 12 to 1400 cadets or midshipmen, and most of their sports are D3 athletics. Um, all academies are gonna have a similar end result. So they're there to build leaders of character with a focus on character. Um, the emphasis is that you will have a lifetime of service. So maybe you'll be a Navy officer for 20 years, but maybe you'll serve for five and get out and be involved in your community. Um, many officers who leave the active duty, the full-time military go in the reserves or the guard and continue to serve, which is what I did. Um, others will work for federal agencies, groups like um, the CIA, FBI, many will be in local office and things like that. So preparing you for service. Um, at an academy, you are training the vast majority of the year, including most of your summers, and that's where you're doing a lot of hands-on training and leadership development. And every academy degree is a bachelor of science degree. So even if you go to West Point and want to do legal studies or Arabic, you still have a bachelor of science degree. So each academy is going to have calculus and chemistry physics, um, things like that, principles of engineering for all students to have that STEM technological background. Uh, the last thing is each student at an academy is a scholar athlete. So maybe D1 or D3, but it could also be club, um, intramural sports, things like that. There's a few things to know about who can apply to an academy. So you can apply if you are not yet a US citizen, but are very close to becoming one. Um, you can attend an academy preparatory school if you're in the citizenship process, but you can't show up on indoctrination day without being a citizen. Uh, you do need to be under 23 that summer you begin. For Kings Point, you can be slightly older. Uh, you must be single, so no dependents, no spouse, no children, elderly parents you care for. Um, you have to be medically qualified and physically fit, which catch a lot of people off guard and where we probably see the most problems. 
um, strong moral character, so making good choices. Um, if things come down to the person who is using drugs and not, the person who has not experimented with drugs is gonna have a way better chance of getting in. Um, there's also certain grades and test score requirements. Some academies publish them, some do not. And then for all the academies, with the exception of Coast Guard, you must have a congressional nomination to be appointed, which is to get an offer of admission. Um, I think this is a great time to maybe start with Jojo and tell me or tell us why you decided to apply to an academy or ROTC. So I personally come from a long line of military officers both my mother and my father and both my grandfathers were officers in the military. Three of them were in the army and three, one of them was in the Air Force. And I've always personally looked up to those family members and wanted to follow in their footsteps as becoming a leader of, our, of our, one of our branches of the military. And I was, I'm the last member in my extended family and no one else has followed in their footsteps. So I'd like to be the first. Awesome. Alex? So personally, I'm not from a military family, but serving is something I've always wanted to do since maybe 10 years old. Around freshman year of high school, I was introduced to the service academies. And while doing my research, I kind of just fell in love with the mission of each and every service academy and the numerous opportunities that come with each academy really led me to wanting to apply there coming my senior year. Excellent. Um, for me, the reason I went into ROTC is that I was tapped by my um, upperclassman mentor in my dorm my freshman year. And when I went to college, I really wanted to live and work overseas and help people. And I wasn't quite sure how I was going to have that opportunity. Um, I was originally looking at the Foreign Service Corps. And then when I went into ROTC, I realized that there were those opportunities and more. Um, there's also really good reasons why not to apply to a military service academy. Um, one of them is sometimes students will say, you know, I'm getting a lot of pressure from my parents. My dad was a captain or a colonel in the military. Um, they may also feel pressure because they have siblings who are in the military, but they don't feel like it's the right calling for them. Um, another reason is because your best friend, boyfriend, girlfriend's going, I guarantee you that is not the reason to go. Um, and lastly, people will see that there's very little, if any, cost to go to an academy. Um, and so they see that as a free ride or a full scholarship, and they don't have money for college. And if that is your case, um, and you have some interest in serving, but don't know if the academy intensity is for you, I would absolutely look at the ROT scholarship because that's going to be a very different experience um, and you can still have some great funding for college. So don't do it just for the money or for the guaranteed job. Uh, this is a very brief profile. We don't have this year's admission stats out yet, but this is the previous year. You can see each of the academies out of a 4.0 GPA are pretty close in GPA for selected students. Be, uh, between like a 3.6 and a 3.89. Um, I can tell you that I've seen students with 4.2 GPAs not get into an academy. I've seen students with really great talents and unusual life circumstances with three sevens get in. So it's not just the grades that will get you in. Um, I've definitely had students with a perfect ACT score and they could have gotten in, but some with lower ones as well. Um, so you can see those admit rates are very low. They're comparable to some of the best schools in the country. But I think the important thing to know is once you get physically and academically and medically qualified, and if you have a congressional nomination, so those four qualifications, at that point, it's about a 50% admit rate. So those odds are way better than 11%. Um, I think it's just important to not give up if this is what your dream is. Um, really quickly to give you a general idea of how the academies look at admissions. Um, each academy is different. Some are very holistic and don't use scoring and percentiles as much as like um, a big, you know, number of figures. So for example, the Coast Guard is that way. Um, other academies rely a little bit more on like an academic composite number and a physical fitness composite number and so on. 
Um, 60% of an academy review, though, will be your academics. So if your class ranks, that will be important. If you don't rank, the academies will look at your school profile and give you a rank. Uh, they also want to see that you have challenged yourself in areas you're really strong in and that you have not shied away from STEM classes. Uh, they'll also look at your test scores. So the academy super score, not as many civilian colleges do, but they will. So they really reward persistence in the academics. Um, and then they just want to see that you're a curious student and you don't just do the minimums. You're really preparing for that challenging curriculum. The 30% that's not academic is going to be almost everything else other than the physical fitness tests and your um, athletic involvement. So that non-academics could be that you are um, a Girl Scout who achieved her gold award, or maybe you're in Civil Air Patrol and achieved the Earhart Award. Um, it could be that you are the vice president of your student council, or you're the shift manager at Chick-fil-A. Uh, there's a lot of different things that go into different types of leadership. It could be your role in your family, your school community, and so on. Um, so did you challenge yourself as a leader? And based on the circumstances, if you had time to volunteer or time to work, or time to um, go deeply into something, did you do that? And then that physical fitness, the big emphasis is on the candidate fitness assessment, uh, different names for different academies, and then also have you been a varsity athlete, a competitive athlete, how far have you taken that? Um, so you can see each of these things um, are in your purview of change. You know, maybe you can't become a captain because there's only one baseball team in your school of 5,000, but can you still take a leadership role? Um, Alex, do you want to maybe tell us what you think helped make you um, like very appealing to the Academy? Yeah, I would love to. So I first want to start off with the fact just because I'm a recruited athlete and it's not mean I got into the Air Force Academy just because I could swim fast across a pool. Absolutely <laughs> not. Uh, it took a lot of effort in the classroom, a lot of community service, um, and I had to display the leadership traits that the Air Force Academy wants. Um, I think something kind of interesting about me as well as my father is Native American, my mom is Russian, I'm very active in my Native American res reservations as well as I've lived internationally. I've been to 48 countries. I have a lot of different cultural perspectives. So I think there are a lot of different things on my application that stood out, um, like not only my swimming ability, but you know, my grades, my leadership qualities and that unique background that I have. So just to touch on what Lisa said, as you could see on the PowerPoint, it's not all based off of your ACT score. There are many different aspects going into it. Definitely. And I know um, I've worked with athletes throughout the years, including when I was in ALO, and sometimes a student can get recruited by an academy, but they won't get a nomination because they go before their board, and maybe their leadership isn't as in-depth as the academy is looking for. Maybe they don't have the academics. Maybe they don't have that level of motivation. Um, so yes, as Alex said, it's a lot of different things, for sure. Okay, JoJo? So I spent most of my high school career playing soccer. I played, I was a captain on my club soccer team and I'm a captain on my varsity high school team. I've been a varsity athlete all four years. And another thing that I did most of my time was I worked on getting my private pilot's license. And as they know, I had 50 hours before even applying. And that's a lot of time in the air. And I also had a lot of book work to do. So they know where my time was spent. And that was something that I think definitely stood out. But I also was a leader in my community and I was a president of the Smile Club at my school. And I, I went on a mission trip to build a house for a family in Mexico by hand with a team of people. And I led part of the team. And I was a tutor at a crisis center. That's not necessarily in my direct area, but it's about 15 minutes away. So it's outside of my immediate bubble and it's for K through five students. And I think that that really stood out as kind of working outside of your community, not just volunteering in your own little bubble. 
That's great. Um, I think it's really important that people pick two or three things that they're passionate about, you know, whether it's service, whether it's your, your art, whether it's employment, um, a nonprofit or a charity you're working with, and go really deeply because the academies and colleges too aren't looking for you to do a little bit on the surface of 10 different groups. They really want to see where you put your time. Um, I'd like to kind of touch on the application process for the academy. So each academy has its own separate application. So when you are a rising senior and you're opening up the common app and you're putting Richmond in there and the University of Southern California, you cannot do that, unfortunately. So if you're applying to multiple academies, those are multiple applications. Um, you are going to be required to submit your standardized test scores. This past year with COVID, there was a little bit of change to that, but the students who had test scores were evaluated earlier, um, and in some cases they had more, you know, opportunities. You're also going to need official transcripts, um, recommendations, or evaluations, and so some academies are asking for three to five, and so they're from very specific things like your PE teacher and coach or maybe your math teacher from junior year. So it's important to prepare for that. You also include your resume and activity list, highlighting your leadership. Um, each academy has an essay or sometimes several essays. There's gonna be the candidate fitness test. It's a different one for the Coast Guard, but the test for the other four academies is the same. There's gonna be a medical exam and that's a large paperwork um, review and then two actual exams. And then most academies require a liaison interview. So that's a relationship you wanna build with your blue and gold officer for the Navy or your field force prep for the Army. And then again, for all the academies except Coast Guard, you'll need a congressional nomination. So this process, you could do a lot of this during the summer, but not all of it because it gets started by the academies and certain things open up as you get farther along. But this has effectively doubled your college application workload. Uh, there's a couple things I always recommend people think about. Um, every piece of your application, it shouldn't be a rush to get it in. It should be time sensitive, but it needs to display your best effort. So you can't put your essays in and then realize you have a typo and get it back. So give yourself a little time between submitting things and, and uh, the deadlines. Um, there's two things on here, pieces of advice that I learned when I was a brand new lieutenant. Sometimes it was a little more painful learning them than others, but the first is that early is on time, on time is late. So when we would go to a staff meeting, everyone had their butts in the chairs 10 minutes early, waiting for an on-time start, just like tonight. And so um, your deadline of when something is due, your paperwork and pieces should be in two to four weeks ahead of that. Um, also, you have to involve so many other people in this application process. So there's teachers and evaluators. There's people who are um, proofing your essays. There's the medical process. And so the whole failure to plan doesn't constitute an emergency on my part. Um, I remember once when I was in ALO and they started um, putting a digital time mark of when a student opened an application and um, a student didn't send his um, recommender invites to the teachers till two days before the national deadline. So his deadline was November 1st and the teachers didn't open them on time. And as an ALO, I had called the academy um, staff who, or who worked our area. And I said, you know, could you give that person a break? And, you know, they've been working really diligently. And she said, if I did it for him, I'd have to do it for 15 other people. So they closed 1,500 apps that weren't completed on time. Um, so there's a real um, consequence to that. And then patience is a virtue. You have to be really patient through this process with yourself, uh, with other people, um, but, you know, stay positive and keep your goals in mind. Uh, this is a great example from the Naval Academy, but it's very similar for other academies of what the candidate cycle looks like. Um, so if you can finish your SAT or ACT tests during your junior year, you are at a really big advantage because you don't need to spend time in the summer and fall still testing. Um, applications to the academies, 
the pre-candidate part is already open. Um, if you applied to a summer program as a junior, that's already taking care of that. But students become candidates or finalists for admission around July 1st or a little bit later. Um, you have typically till the end of the calendar year to get your application started. Again, it varies by academy. Um, some academies like the Coast Guard Academy actually use early action. They're the only people that do that. And that deadline is October 15th. So it's the very first deadline in admissions. So the later you apply, I would say the less your chances of being admitted. And I see that year after year. Um, applicants are notified of their admission status in different ways. There's rolling decision dates. There's the end date. But by April 15th, you should know. Um, there's plenty of people who get appointments in December, January, February, March, but the final ones come out very late in the game. Um, and then your plebe summer, slob summer, depending on where you go, what it's called is usually late June, early July. Um, a couple other things that you don't see on here would be nomination deadlines and then getting your medical exam done and getting your interviews done. So those are all part of getting that application completed. Um, the, each academy has its own deadline, again, for the medical, and so some um, have an earlier deadline than others. So you just really can't afford to wait too long. Um, this is the part where I feel like it could be a little overwhelming for students to look at it, um, but we'll definitely get some advice at the end of the next couple slides. So if you are a rising senior, we're going to talk about what you should be doing before school ends if an academy is your plan. Then the slide after, we'll talk about this summer what to do and then what to do in the fall. So if you need to take a screenshot, this would be a good place. Um, so for students who are finishing up junior year, if you have not applied to the summer programs like Summer Seminar or AIM, um, SLE, you should go onto the Academy website and do a pre-candidate questionnaire. So that's going to need your social, your congressional district, things like that. Um, you also need to figure out what is my plan for summer? So am I going to take part in Girls State? Am I volunteering with the Boys Club? Am I working as a lifeguard? Am I working on my military service project, Eagle Scout, things like that. Maybe you're going to some kind of camps. Um, this is also the time to speak to your counselors and the teachers and other leaders in the community who are going to write recommendations for the academy um, or who are writing recommendations for your nomination packets. So make sure you go online and see what you need for those. Um, most teachers and school counselors are not working in the summer and they're not opening those emails from you. Um, also, finish the junior year as strong as you can be academically, because most academies aren't seeing your fall grades when they're making a decision. In some cases they are, but usually they're not. Um, another thing that's really important, I mentioned many people fail the physical fitness tests. So it's important for you to talk to your athletic director or your coach and take the candidate fitness assessment before summer gets out or starts and then set goals and train weekly. Um, I'd say last year I had two students who got injured while they were training for this test and all of them were athletes. Um, so then they were injured, had to recover, then they had a PT and that put off their deadlines. And in some cases it means you can't apply as early as you want. Uh, the last thing is I mentioned the local liaisons. So reach out to them and establish a relationship with them as well. So lots of things to do before school ends. Um, this long list is what I would recommend most people, if they're in town, if they have the ability to do it, go as far as you can on this list. Um, there's one item at the bottom that talks about civilian colleges, but everything on here is pretty much related to the military academies or ROTC. Um, so if you're lucky enough to be part of a summer virtual camp like SLE with Army, be involved in that and take those lessons away and be able to write about it and talk about it. Um, we talked about goals for the summer, so make sure you've done those, reach those, and finalize that resume. Um, if you are still testing, make sure you have those dates in the calendar and can get those tests done in time to apply for your nominations. So nominations vary, but in some areas like the South, they could be due as early as August. In California, it's a little bit later, like October. So you can't be waiting to take your first test, you know, till December. Um, also, 
continue to train for the fitness exam, and then do your military research. And I know the students will talk a little bit about that, but it's really important that you be able to talk about the branch or branches you wanna go into, what you would like to do with those, why those are good fits for you, um, and more. So you really need to know what you're doing. Um, sometimes a counselor will hire me to look at their student's application, and they'll say, I really wanna be a tank driver in the Marine Corps and a private. Um, sometimes they'll talk about the wrong rank for the service. Um, the Marine Corps no longer has tanks. The Marines are actually letting some of their Marines go over to the Army because the Army has the only tank mission. So if you weren't keeping up on events, you might not know that. And if a person reading your nomination or academy essay reads that, they're going to see that you're not in the know. So just important to kind of dot those I's, cross those T's. Um, once the summer hits, it's okay to submit your test scores for an academy and then look at virtual events. So every academy is doing virtual briefings, virtual campus tours, um, a lot of congressional districts and senators are doing them. Um, you don't have to go to one that's in your area. You can listen to another district just to hear the different junior officers and cadets and midshipmen talking. Uh, the last couple of things work on your nomination packets during the summer because they are a lot of time. Um, and if you are applying to several academies or commissioning programs, pick the academy that's your top choice and do that application as far as it can go in the summer because that medical and fitness tests um, should or might count for the other academy. So that already takes you know two big chunks out of that future work. Uh, the other thing is make sure you're researching, are you medically fit for commissioning? And that's something I do with students very early. Um, interview prep. And so some of my students have interviewed with parents and family members. Um, I do a lot of interview prep. I have two officers that work with me that do that. But you can also have people in your community who are veterans, who are military members, who can help with that too. So really important. Um, if you are applying for an ROTC scholarship program, it's important to do informational interviews with units um, because that is going to make you calmer and more knowledgeable when you do your scholarship interview um, or when you do an academy interview. And also, in some cases, they can advocate for you with admissions at schools, not all schools, but some. And then also some schools will give you supplemental scholarships. So if you knew that because you talked to the Army unit at IU, um, maybe that's going to move up your list. And that supplemental room and board scholarship could help you go to college maybe for free. Um, so it's important to do that research. Lastly, finalize your school list in the summer. This is all students. <laughs> Okay, so we got through most of this, uh, the seniors in the fall, and then we'll talk to our panelists next. Um, so seniors, finish that physical fitness test when school opens. Do not wait for your football season because you tell me that you will be in the best shape of your life and then you will inevitably get hurt. And I see that every year. Um, also get your nomination packets in early, apply everywhere you can, um, finish those standardized tests if not done already, submit transcripts and scores, um, submit your academy apps, keep a copy of everything. Um, it's really important to, you know, with the, with COVID, people's internet was down and they had all sorts of issues with sending things and scanning and getting signatures. And a lot of people were really scrambling at the last minute. So, you know, hopefully we're coming out of that, but give yourself plenty of time. Um, in the fall, you should continue to interview prep so you're calm and confident and knowledgeable. And then um, look and see if there's campus visits, especially some schools like the Naval Academy will do candidate visit weekends. Um, some academies are looking to open back up in the fall to have visitors there. So take advantage if you can, if that's safe for you. Uh, do your medical exam early. Um, I've actually seen during COVID someone's medical exam cleared in a week. That is the first time I've seen that in over 20 years. But most people can take eight weeks, sometimes 12, sometimes 16 weeks to get cleared. So if you didn't start that till January, you may not be cleared in time to use your academy appointment. Um, in the fall, you want to finish your ROTC applications. If you're only applying to ROTC, get that in early to leverage that for admissions. Um, and also, don't forget about your civilian college applications.
Okay. Um, that's a lot of talking for me, but I would love to hear from my students. Um, Alex, do you want to maybe talk a little bit about your timeline of when you started looking at the academy, when you got really busy applying, and maybe when you're done, talk a little bit about the athletic timeline as well? Absolutely. So as I mentioned before, I started looking at the academy maybe my freshman year of high school, and I didn't really get serious about it until... I went in the summer of 2019 to an Air Force swim camp, and there I got in contact with the coaches. And over a period of, of about a year, I was talking to the coaches on and off, seeing if the academy was actually a place I wanted to go to. And after a few months of talking, I realized that is the school I wanted to go to. And uh, as Lisa mentioned, like you want to give yourself a lot of time with this application because it's quite hefty. So. During that long period of quarantine we had over the summer, I was training for that CFA, the physical exam. I was trying to hop on the application that opened up for me on July 1st. Um, in terms of athletic recruitment um, application deadlines, the coaches encourage all the athletes to get in their stuff as soon as possible because as Lisa mentioned before, there are problems. Um, I know some of my fellow teammates who had to go back for additional screenings on the medical exams because they had asthma when they were like eight or something. Fortunately, I wasn't one of those people. I got my medical exam cleared in like two weeks or so. So I was fortunate with that, but I got my whole application done around August. And then after that, I was working on nominations. That took me about a month or so. I was done in September. And then once I had all that done, I started on civilian schools. Excellent. And um, like you said, you can get an appointment and not be medically cleared. So I know you had some teammates that, you know, had verbally committed and weren't able to attend for sure. Um, awesome. Jojo, do you want to talk about your process and then also ROTC? Yeah, so... I started being interested in the academy again my freshman year as well. I went to a soccer camp at both the Naval Academy and the Air Force Academy, and I really loved both schools and wanted to continue that interest and try to apply to them as the time came. And I actually started the application process a little bit earlier because I applied to both of their summer programs and became a candidate as I didn't have to fill out the questionnaire because I already was one and that really helped me and just I started interviewing for girls state as well and that was really good interview prep for when I had my real interviews and I started the application process the summer between the real application process the summer between my junior and senior year I think I got the nominations done first because that was the first few deadlines. And I had my first interview, my first ever real interview was with my admissions liaison officer with the Air Force Academy and it was on October 18th. So that was really early fall. I had a lot of going on, a lot going on with school and I think it really helped to have my summer stuff done and be able to submit it and not really worry about it anymore. And then I ended up having six interviews after that with one, one of which was in person with uh, different ROTC units and with further up in ROTC and getting those scholarships early really helped because it kind of lifted a weight off my shoulders. I knew that I could go to college and I knew that my end goal would be the same no matter what, if I got into the academy or not. I knew that I was eventually going to become an officer in the military, which was my goal. Awesome. Um, would either of you like to add anything about civilian colleges and that timeline? Yep, um, and personally, the academy was always my plan A, but Lisa kind of convinced me like you need three other schools like plan A, C, D, because like you have no idea what's going to happen exactly. You might get injured, you might have something that you didn't know about. So I knocked this out pretty quickly quickly once I was done with all the academy stuff. So I had all that craziness out of the way. And that took me maybe about a month. It was pretty easy because everything was on, um, I don't know, is it, what is the website? The Common App. 
Common App, yes. All of it was on Common App, so it was pretty easy application in general for me. Good. I, so I, I was actually a little bit different because I didn't have the, the athletic recruitment to have that in my corner. So I, I finished my Common App essay very, before I started my senior year, and then I was basically just doing supplementals after that. And it's, it's a definitely a seventh class. I only took six classes my senior year. And first semester, it, the college application process was a seventh class, so I had to make time for it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, I totally agree with everything you guys are saying. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, I kind of as we're starting to wind down and get to your questions, I wanted to talk about some things I see that students learn through this process. So um, sometimes a student will say, I want to apply to all the academies and that's not something I recommend. I think there are very different environments and outcomes. Um, I think maybe a person who could do great at one, maybe another wouldn't be the right culture for them. But you really have to think about what you want for your college experience and your life experience and then after an academy. Um, everybody's reflected on time management is so important. Um, attention to detail, you know, you really can't afford to have errors in these applications. Um, when I work with students, even civilian ones, and we check their common app, I think, does anyone send an application in with no errors? Because it never feels, it feels like it's easy to spot them as an adult, but maybe not as a student who's done and looked at something a million times. Um, I think it's important, not just the plan B and C and D, but not to give up if this is your dream. And so more students get into an academy on their second try. Um, some students applied to the ROTC scholarships. I know for Alex, she didn't apply for that, but all of her schools had Air Force ROTC. So when she went to her interview, she was able to say, if I don't get in, this is my, my backup plan. Um, but many students go into ROTC and then reapply for an academy. And sometimes they find that they're super happy in ROTC and don't need that other experience. So you don't quite know where you're going to end up. Um, but I'd love to kind of hear from you guys, maybe Jojo, what you think you learned applying to college and to the academy. So my biggest thing that I learned was definitely to trust myself and my accomplishments. Like at the point that you're in your interview process, like you, there's nothing more that you can do to boost your GPA. There's nothing more that you can do to boost your test scores. It's over, it's done with. You need to show your interviewer like who you really are as a person because at the academies they're looking for the well-rounded individual they're not looking as Lisa said before for the 4.2 and the 1600 SAT they're looking for the individual that has done stuff in their community has participated and has just a well-rounded individual in general and that's something that I definitely learned to be proud of of myself is that I'm more well-rounded and not as much on the academic side. Excellent. Alex? Yeah, I would like to touch up on that. So when trying to choose an academy to apply to, because I, as Lisa said, you shouldn't apply to a ton of academies at once because that's a ton on your plate. I had to think about not only the academy, but the service itself. Um, personally, I was in between West Point and Air Force. It was a pretty tight fight for me, but after thinking it over, I realized that the Air Force was the service that I wanted to go into and um, that the Army really wasn't. Excellent. Okay, so a couple admissions lessons. Um, as we touched on before, each academy opens their application sometime in July. This last year with COVID, that was pushed back for some academies, but be ready to start working on those pieces then. Um, every academy and ROTC scholarship has a different amount of work and different requirements, and their timelines are different. Um, also, again, you could start in the summer, but get those pre-candidate questionnaires done before summer comes. And then really, I know that many of the academy deadlines are as late as December, January, but you don't want to be wrapping up that late. 
Um, there are programs that begin reviewing applications on a rolling basis, like Navy starts giving out letters of assurances, which are early offers, as early as September. So you would have to have your whole application in that early um, if you wanted to be part of that first review. And then again, appointments can come out really late, which is really, really tough for people. Um, so that's why it's great to have those civilian college apps in. That's why it's great to have the ROTC scholarships. Um, I know JoJo said that she applied to ROTC really early, um, but I definitely had students this year who were applying to ROTC and you know doing their interviews in the winter time. And some of them didn't find out till April when the last scholarship review boards happened. So that makes it a little more stressful when you're choosing where to go. Okay, um, last couple of final thoughts when you think about what you wanna do, um, go back to who you are and why you wanna serve and what makes you unique. And so there isn't that one profile, like we talked about how great Girls and Boys State is and how it's wonderful, wonderful to be a varsity athlete and how important service in your community is. Um, but think about what makes you different, um, your home, your life, those things. And then make sure you've put academics first, you know, not um, acting or dance or whatever your, your other passion is. And do make sure that you've taken the STEM courses that you need. So um, most academy students are doing AP physics and Calc AB and a couple of years of language and AP computer science. Um, again, that varies by where you go to school, um, but be willing to challenge yourself even if you are more of a humanities person. Um, definitely set goals for yourself every year. So what do I wanna do in terms of academics every semester and as a leader? Um, and make sure you're the person that the teachers go to in the classroom and that your classmates look up to because those recommendations are gonna be really important and that's what the academies are looking for. Uh, we talked about this already, have multiple plans. And then really quickly, I wanna to touch on alternate paths. And so it's important to look into ROTC. Most officers come from that commissioning program. Um, there are ROTC units for Army, Navy, and Air Force. Um, Air Force will begin commissioning and have begun commissioning into the Space Force. Navy ROTC also commissions into the Marine Corps. Um, if you look at the host units and the Crosstown programs, there are thousands of opportunities out there. There are also senior military colleges. So these are schools with Corps of Cadets programs. So that's gonna be more intense than an ROTC commitment, but a little less intense than an academy. An example of that could be um, Virginia Polytech, Texas A&M, Norwich University, University of North Georgia, and so on. Um, definitely apply for the scholarship program if that's important to you, but at least have those ROTC schools there. And then some people who maybe don't have the money for college or maybe want to become an officer, but maybe would like to get more life skills and experience, they may look at going in the reserves or the guard for the different branches, serving a little bit, getting some money for college and experience. Um, that's not a path for everybody, but that is a good path for some. And then again, if the academy is really your dream, think about reapplying. Um, I can tell you that most people who tell me they're going to reapply, enroll in ROTC, are really happy and don't reapply. But occasionally some do, and they've gone on. Um, I know our students have big futures coming up, so I just want to hear maybe um, how they've been preparing for what this next step is going to be. Um, Alex? So basic training starts in a little over a month. And aside from going to the numerous swim practices I have a week, I've been incorporating a lot of running and lifting because, I mean, I'm athletic in the water, but on land, it needs some work. So <laughs> I've been working on that as well as just mentally preparing for a culture shock. As I mentioned before, I don't come from a military family. So I know going into basic training, it's not going to be something I'm used to. Um, that doesn't deplete my excitement by any means, but just mentally preparing to have, to be shocked, I guess maybe is a better word for it is what I'm doing at the moment. But in that process, I'm also connecting with a lot of other Air Force appointees that are coming with me this summer. And uh, through that, we've been I've actually met a few in my local area. We've met up, you know, we've talked together and kind of going through the same thing. So I'm excited. 
That's awesome. Expect the unexpected. Jojo? So similarly with me, I'm finishing up both my high school and my club season this year because of COVID. We have to play them both at the same time. So I'm doing double days practicing, having like four games a week and just trying to keep my body healthy. But also I've been lifting a lot and work making sure that my push-ups and sit-ups and pull-ups are still up to par because obviously I'm not doing that at soccer practice. I'm doing a lot of the running at soccer practice. So I'm not really working on that right now. But again, like Alex said, I've been connecting with a lot of other Navy ROTC girls that are going to Vanderbilt. And we have our group chat that we're preparing each other with. And we have our new student indoctrination. Mine is in June and some others are starting in May. So just getting prepared for that is, is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, as we know, COVID this last year changed everything, but I think the lesson for Academy kids that I really saw was be flexible, be adaptable, and don't give up. Um, civilian colleges and the military wanted to know what did people do differently during COVID. So if your athletic season was cut short, if you couldn't do your plays, if you weren't able to go to a military summer camp, how did you lose that, use that time to learn, to grow, to stretch, to get a new skill? So definitely keep that in mind. Um, also moving forward, you know, the academies are still looking at those test scores, even though some colleges are not requiring them. And again, ROTC is as well, um, but also don't forget to take advantage of virtual experiences too. Okay, I wanted to save some time for all of um, Ginger's questions from the audience. So take it away, Ginger. Okay, we've got 10 minutes, so it's going to be like a lightning round on the game show. Um, we're going to go as quickly as we can and try and cover as many questions as we can. Um, so if I can start with a question for you, Lisa, and then Alex to share your ex personal experience. So Lisa, how does the athletic director at a high school know what's on the physical exam in order to help a student prepare? And then Alex, if you could talk a little bit about the actual training that you did to get ready for that exam on top of what you're already doing as an athlete? Great question. So if you go to any academy's website, you can Google the candidate fitness assessment and there'll be information on there. Some academies will say, this is what the average girl does for pull-ups or the average boy for sit-ups. Um, there's also some really good YouTube videos. There's one put out by the Air Force Academy where you can actually see how things are done correctly. Um, and then the academies will also send an information guide and a form to the coach. Alex? Yeah, for sure. So when Lisa showed me the average scores for the physical exam going into the Air Force Academy, I kind of set that as a standard. And during over quarantine, I had my mom proctor a fake fitness exam for the first time. So I could see what focus points. And personally for me, it was the mile at the end and the sprint. I forgot how far of a sprint it was, but there was a sprint in there as well as pull-ups so over time I just went on YouTube to see what would work because I wasn't able to get in contact with my coach because of COVID and um, you know I was a little stupid at first I'm not gonna lie I went out and ran like half a marathon like the day after that thinking oh my distance running is gonna be amazing it was <laughs> I actually got hurt and I had to take a month off but then afterwards I gradually built up um, mileage. Um, I found some exercise to help build up some fast twitch fibers for the sprints and then pull-ups. I actually had a pull-up bar mounted from, I ordered one off of Amazon and every time I walked past my room, I do three pull-ups. And by the time I took it by the end of the summer, I maxed out on almost everything. So that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Jojo, can you tell us a little bit about your decision to pursue the ROTC program at Vanderbilt versus going to an academy? Yeah, so I know that both, of, I, they reach the same end goal being an officer in the military. And I also wanted to do aviation and still do, but I can be an aviator for the Navy, but I could also have gone into aviation in the Air Force. But I really learned that I wanted a full college experience uh, at a civilian school. And 
I learned a lot about myself through the process of doing all my interviews and everything. And I thought that that was what I wanted, but I learned more about myself and learned that maybe with COVID, I wanted to have a little bit more freedom because I was stuck in my house all year. So that's really what led me to my decision. And I knew that I could still continue to have a military lifestyle and be surrounded by other students that want are driven at the same as me and we can help each other work better. Thank you. Lisa, if a student is really stronger in the humanities, but has, you know, sort of the background in STEM, they've taken calculus, they've mm -hmm. taken um, the physics and that sort of thing. Is there one academy or one branch of service that might be a better fit for them than the others? You know, I wouldn't say there's one branch, so it's really good to have that preparation for both because you will need to do those college courses. Um, I would say each academy, you know, Coast Guard has less majors than others based on their size, but they still have management and government, so covering business and um you know, political science, but the larger three um, are going to have a little bit more like legal studies and, you know, um, military history and things like that. So you can find something everywhere you go. You know, um, when I was in ROTC, I was the only non-technical cadet in my unit of 125 people. So we would always joke like somebody had to know how to read and write and speak, <laughs> you know, no offense to my engineering classmates, but yeah. I was like a little bit of that outlier. You learned how to read and write and speak very well. I would. It Thank you. <laughs> um, quick question. Is the Space Force planning to launch an academy? No, they are not. So right now they're commissioning out of USAFA. This was the first time in May. Um, they'll continue to do that. And then they're commissioning through Air Force ROTC. And then West Point is looking at adding too, because um, Guardians, which are the Space Force personnel, are coming from both Army and Air Force. Thank you. You mentioned, you mentioned early on that uh, cybersecurity as an example at Air Force, is that something that students could study at other branches as well? Yes, um, not so much at the Merchant Marine Academy, but the other academies do have larger programs and um, Navy and Army have and Coast Guard have newer cyber centers as well. So definitely. Um, Jojo, could you talk a little bit about how the ROTC pro application process differed from the academy process? So with the ROTC process, it's not, uh, I didn't have to do an essay. I just had to answer a few questions. So it wasn't as rigorous in that sense, but I did have to interview twice for my Navy ROTC scholarship. I had to interview once with my local, I live near Cal Berkeley and I interviewed with that unit. And then I interviewed with his boss's boss's boss in Marin and was had to, that was in person. And usually it is in person, but with COVID, that was the only interview that I had in person. But the questions, you still have to stay physically fit. You have, a, there is a fitness test that you do and it's different for each branch. And the, I think just the, the fact of not having the essays was the only difference, really. Thank you. Alex, you talked earlier about your discernment kind of leading you to the Air Force Academy. Can you share with us what helped you know that that was your branch? Um, ultimately, I knew I wanted to go into either aviation or cyber warfare, and I felt that the Air Force specialized in that a little bit. Um, better than the Army, personally, so that's why I chose Air Force over the Army. Thank you for sharing that. So we're getting close to the end of the hour, and I want to be re respectful of our wonderful panelists' time, as well as those of us, who, those of you who are tuning in um, and hanging on every word, as I certainly am. Um, so I want to ask each of you a question um, as we as we look towards the end. Lisa, what is the question that you get asked the most? That would definitely be, am I starting too late? You know, have I, has the door closed for me? And so the earlier you begin, the better. So if you can start this process of, of discernment and preparation as a high school freshman, that's great. But ideally at least going into junior year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jojo, what do you think was the best resource you took advantage of as you were learning and winding your way through these multiple paths um, 
what re what resources would you recommend for students who are embarking on this journey? Yeah, so I read a lot of books pertaining to how to ace your Air Force Academy interview. And that actually is the title of one of the books that I read and highlighted. And I actually worked on interview stars, your star stories that you can kind of work with them and put them into answering certain questions that you think you might be asked. Actually, one of the questions that I was asked that I didn't have an answer to that I had to think on my toes for was you are at your retirement ceremony. You've served your 20 years. What are they saying about you? And that was a question that I had to think on my toes for, but almost every other question I had an answer to with my star stories. Excellent. Alex, what are you looking forward to the most about your college military experience? What are you most excited about? We heard that you're gearing up for basic training. I don't know that that's maybe the part you're most excited about. So what are, what are you most looking forward to? Honestly, meeting the people there. Uh, everyone who's gone into the academy are pretty special people. And since we all are kind of going through a, a challenge, it creates some pretty strong bonds. So I'm excited to meet the people there. Fantastic. Well, I'm thrilled for both of you and the journey that you have ahead. And I feel deeply grateful for the service that you're about to embark in. And I, I honestly and genuinely feel like the future is in some really good hands here, um, Lisa. So thank you for, for sending them on, on their way. It's thank my pleasure. All. I'm so proud of them. With good reason, with very good reason. I'm so grateful that all three of you could be with us tonight, and I'm grateful um, for this chance to have a conversation together. If you uh, who are watching are interested in talking with Lisa a bit more, she's happy um, to connect with you and offer you a 40-minute consultation, and there will be information um, in the email that you'll get tomorrow, hopefully with this recording and the presentation, that you can um, take advantage of following up on that if you'd like. If we can be of help to you here at Apple Ruth, um, if you are um, thinking about standardized testing and how to get started with that um, and all that good stuff, if you're looking to really nail it on your final exams now that you're almost through APs, not quite, um, feel free to let us know. We'll be glad to help. And I hope that you might be able to join us as well for College Week, which is a program we have coming up from May 17th to the 20th. Um, it's four nights of webinars that are designed to help you take the stress out of the college admissions process. Um, I think the more knowledge you have, the more confident you can be. And so that's what we're trying to do. So you can register at appleruth.com backslash college week. Um, you'll get a reminder for that and all of these other things we've been talking about in your email tomorrow. Thank you all so much for being with us. We are really grateful for this conversation and the opportunity to spread good ideas and information and not germs um, during a pandemic. Um, so thanks everybody for being with us and have a great night. Thank you. Good night.